Well, September is dead and buried in the cold, cold ground, which means October is here. Time to start transitioning into soup mode, breaking out the good sweaters, and watching as many horror movies as you can cram into 744 hours. And with horror movies comes a nearly ever-expanding universe of tropes that seem to stretch on for miles. And since today is Horror Trope Day, check your calendars, we wanted to salute the things we've come to expect in our scary movies, why we love them, and examine the history behind the movies that helped originate some of the lasting touchstones of horror cinema. Deciding what tropes to focus on was a hard choice, especially since the horror genre has been around practically since the beginning of filmmaking. We've narrowed this video down to three chapters that are basically acting as umbrellas to include a few different examples of tropes, otherwise this video would be super long. Well, super longer. And we're going to be talking about tropes that we can specifically track the history of and that are solely based in the world of movies and filmmaking. So things like man-eating animals, demons, and clowns aren't going to be included here because they've been terrifying long before movies existed. I'm hungry! Basically, we're not trying to make this a whole video that feels like Randy from Scream giving a lecture. <laughs> Big no -no! In the immense growing list of horror tropes, there's one that looms large over the rest. <laughs> no, not you. I was gonna say jump scares a tried and true method for getting a reaction from an audience. A strong build of tension, a short stretch of silence followed by a jolt of action, and usually a loud accompanying sting. Some are good. Some are bad. Some are really, really long. Some were created with electric buzzers hidden under the theater seats, if you were watching the William Castle movie, The Tingler. At any time you are conscious of a tingling sensation, you may obtain immediate relief by screaming. It's been used more times than anyone can count, unless you got a lot of free time in your hands, in which case, go crazy. But where did the jump scare as we know it today come from? Movies have been around for almost 130 years, and your definition of a jump scare may vary from ours. We can see early quasi-examples in films like Nosferatu, The Phantom of the Opera, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and that time all those dumb people thought a train was actually careening into a movie theater in 1896. It's fine. All those people are dead now, they won't see this. But the jump scare in American movies was born all the way back in 1942 in the Jacques Tourneur film, Cat People. In 1942, RKO Pictures decided to create a low-budget horror division for their studio. At this time, RKO was known mostly for producing musicals and comedies like Bringing Up Baby, Swing Time, and Too Many Cooks. Believe it or not, not that one. RKO was in a bit of financial trouble in 1942 following the release of Citizen Kane a year earlier. The Orson Welles movie that would go on to be called one of the greatest films of all time bombed hard at the box office when it was released in 1941. A big reason for that was because movie theaters were afraid to screen Citizen Kane due to the retaliation from newspaper magnate and obscenely rich lunatic William Randolph Hearst. Fun little horror history fact. Camille Rossi, the superintendent of construction of Hearst Castle, was the father of Millicent Patrick, the artist who would go on to design the creature from the Black Lagoon. Hearst hated Citizen Kane so much, he actively tried to suppress its release, banned the mention of it from his papers, and tried to label Orson Welles as a communist on a frequent basis. That was a long way of saying RKO started partially making horror movies as a cheap and easy way to recoup their losses from Citizen Kane. Novelist and screenwriter Val Luton was put in charge of producing horror pictures for RKO and pretty much shadow directed a lot of the films he produced. Luton adapted his own 1930 short story, The Bagheeda, into the B-movie Cat People in 1942, and that's where we potentially see the first jump scare. Now, all of this happened under the Hayes Code, which was a set of rules the motion picture producers and distributors of America put into effect as a way to self-censor movies. Basically, it's a big list of you can't do that's a bunch of high-waisted dorks slapped on Hollywood because the 1920s were a pretty wild and scandalous time for the film industry, which is putting it lightly. But there's one privilege they can't take away from me, you dirty little sneak. The code would eventually be abandoned in 1968, and the MPAA was established with Jack Valenti and his cheeks at the helm. Please, I beg you, let me finish. This is very, very important. Later. But later. So by Hayes Code standards, a bus coming to a sudden stop was probably scary as shit. 
This effect would become known as the loot and bust technique, and is loosely defined by when viewers are scared by something completely harmless, like a cat jumping out of the shadows, or in this case, a bus coming into frame and slamming on its brakes. Credit for the effect potentially falls to editor Mark Robson, who would also direct horror movies for RKO. The reason I said potentially is because Robson might have borrowed this idea from Robert Wise. Robson was Robert Wise's assistant editor on Citizen Kane. During Kane, somewhere deep in the runtime, a transition is spliced with creepy footage of a cockatoo screeching. Here it is, it's crazy jarring. Mm, yeah, but I know how to handle him. Like the time his wife left him. <laughs> This probably could be considered the actual first iteration of a jump scare. The same desired effect is achieved, but not through any use of the story. And Wells himself said he did it to wake people up who were potentially dozing off in the theater. That one scene where you suddenly cut to a cockatoo screeching just before- That was to wake up the, the audience. <laughs> It's as That's the as entire that. significance of the cockatoo. I just can't get a <laughs> I can't get a pretentious answer out of you. It's weirdly fitting that the film possibly responsible for the first jump scare is the same movie that led to RKO making horror movies in the first place. Kind of like being a wine spokesman and getting drunk on the set of a commercial. Ah, the French champagne. That comparison doesn't work at all. We just wanted a reason to show that clip. There'd be other iterations, but jump scares wouldn't hit their stride until the 1970s with movies like Brian De Palma's Carrie. The first jump scare with some danger behind it, though, did hit theaters in the 1951 film The Thing from Another World, which would be remade by John Carpenter in 1982 and would in turn bless the world with one of the greatest horror films ever made. You gotta be kidding. Okay. Bit of a heftier section here, because we're gonna try and talk about the first slasher of film history and how they never seem to die, at least not the first time. But what exactly is the criteria for a slasher villain? We've broken our slasher scale system, it's patented, down to four very serious criteria. Does the killer wear a mask or have some horrific disfigurement? Is their preferred killing implement some kind of tool or weapon that isn't a straight up gun? Does the killer possess somewhat supernatural powers like incredible off-camera speed? And do they tend to target groups of people, primarily the youths? Ted, hey, Ted, where the hell's Parks grow? <laughs> Before you get mad, and I know he fits into most of these criteria, but we're not gonna be talking about Freddy Krueger. Because of his murder dream magic and skeleton powers, he stands alone. Kind of like Steve Vai or Joe Satriani. <laughs> The first on-screen deaths in cinema can both be tracked back to one of history's greatest monsters, Thomas Edison. The first being from the 1894 short film Rat Killing, which has been lost to time. Distributed by Edison's manufacturing company as a means to show off his kinetoscope, the short shows a rat terrier killing six large rats. That's it. Entertainment used to just be gambling on nature. Also, why did Edison love shorts about animals dying? Justice for Topsy. But the first human death on screen is from the 1895 short, The Execution of Mary Queen of Scots. Can you guess what happens in it? The less than 30 second short depicts the beheading of Mary Queen of Scots at the hands of a masked man wielding an ax. And that answers our first slasher question. Thank you so much for watching. If we wanna seriously track the first slasher in film history, there's a lot of movies we can start with. Like the 1926 film, The Bat. Adapted from the horror novel The Circular Staircase by Mary Roberts Reinhardt, this silent film depicts a group of people being terrorized by a masked murderer in a spooky mansion that has like five candles spread across a dozen rooms, like some kind of reverse Batman. There are many films we can point to for influencing the slasher genre. You got your Psycho, of course, or the 1971 film Fright, which is credited as giving life to the endangered babysitter archetype, or even Francis Ford Coppola's first film, Dementia 13. But we're not gonna talk about any of those because we're off to Italy, baby. There's a wide variety of Italian horror that we can point to as inspirations not just for slashers, but American thrillers too. Now, if you're not familiar with Jallo films, here's a crash course. Mystery and thriller novels from the US and UK used to get translated and published in Italy with yellow covers. That was so prevalent that Italians just started calling all thriller fiction Jallo, Italian for yellow. As far as the films go, Jallo cinema began in the mid 60s with Mario Bava's The Girl Who Knew Too Much and Blood and Black Lace. 
From there, more and more filmmakers began making sexy, jet-setting thrillers, which often revolved around inheritance schemes, generally through driving women insane. However, beginning with Dario Argento's 1971 debut film, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, the Italian film industry went through a giallo boom. Between 1971 and 1975, literally hundreds of these movies were made and shipped to all corners of the globe to make money. With Argento, the emphasis became much more on suspense leading to graphic violence. Other filmmakers pushed the envelope in scares and gore until the Jallo bubble burst right around the time the American slasher movie began in earnest. We can still see a lot of influence from these gory or jally in these slasher movies of the late 70s and early 80s. Mario Bava's 1964 film, Blood and Black Lace, features a masked murderer lurking around a mansion picking off my models one by one. Even his 1971 film, A Bay of Blood, was directly ripped off by films like Friday the 13th, Parts 1 and 2. And while those films definitely inspired a lot of what would come out of the height of the slasher era, there's one specific film we want to highlight, and that's the 1973 Sergio Martino picture, Torso. 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 Is Torso good? Well, it may not be the very best of Martino's Jallo cycle. That honor goes to your vice is a locked room and only I have the key. But Torso has the winning combo of a masked psychopath wielding a hacksaw, sometimes a knife, and also a very strong scarf. The targets of his attacks are a collection of university students, and he somehow is always just there. You know what I mean? He's just, he's just there. The third act of the film also might be the first iteration of the final girl, a full year before Bob Clark's Black Christmas, which we will get to. One thing it doesn't have, though, is the not dead yet moment. I'm not dead! What? Nothing. We all know the type of setup I'm talking about. We're in the ninth inning of the third act of the movie. Our protagonist has bested the killer, and they're usually having a good cry. While we watch the very much alive killer get up for another round. Like Chumbawamba. It's a trope that spans across multiple genres in a thousand different forms, but is mostly associated with the big names of the slasher era. Your Michael Myerses, your Jason Voorheeses, your Billiam Zane in Dead Calm. Billy Zane, come on our channel. We like you a lot. I can hold up, hold up, well then they're motherfuckers! But the gen- <laughs> It's true. Yeah, we do. Yeah. But the genesis of this trope on screen potentially came from the film adaptation of the play Wait Until Dark, which was written by Frederick Knott, who also did write the Hitchcock film Dial M for Murder. Wait Until Dark features Audrey Hepburn as a blind woman who defends herself against a trio of home intruders. Spoilers for a movie that came out before we landed on the moon, but at the climax of that film, Alan Arkin is stabbed in the chest by Hepburn, and a few moments later literally springs back to life to get his revenge. Part of the scene's lasting impact may have something to do with the film's original release. In a strangely brilliant move by the filmmakers, in an effort to mimic the theater experience, they paid for a print ad and cautionary trailer that read, During the last eight minutes of this picture, the theater will be darkened to the legal limit to heighten the terror of the breathtaking climax which takes place in nearly total darkness on the screen. If there are sections where smoking is permitted, those patrons are respectfully requested not to jar the effect by lighting up during this sequence. And of course, no one will be seated at this time. Who would be seated for the last 10 minutes of a movie? Ridiculous. This gimmick worked out, and Wait Until Dark cleaned up at the box office, making $17 million, which is equivalent to over $156 million in 2023 dollars. Because inflation is a real thing that we applied to a system of commerce that we made up to begin with. So while large and lurking goons are the Larry Birds of the he's not dead yet trope, they very likely wouldn't have it if it wasn't for a five foot nine theater actor tackling a tiny British woman. <laughs> In the 1992 book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film, author Carol J. Clover coined the term The Final Girl. If you're a horror fan, you've probably become very aware of this trope. But if you're not, the final girl archetype laid out by Clover is defined by a woman who is the sole survivor of the group of people who are killed by some type of psychotic killer, and said final girl is the one who gets the final confrontation with the villain. Another tenet that has been tied to this archetype is that the final girl is normally sexually unavailable, doesn't engage in drinking and drugs with the rest of the normally teenage characters, all around the most innocent of the group. There are lots of performances, even during the time of the Hays Code, that could be considered early final girl examples. Vera Miles and Psycho, which stirred up a lot of controversy in 1960. Not just because of the on-screen death of star Janet Leigh, but because Hitchcock showed a flushing toilet on screen, which he had already done almost 30 years prior in the 1936 film Secret Agent. And the first flushing toilet was actually shown in the 1930 comedy Going Wild. So if you want a video about famous on-screen bathrooms, please go outside.
There's also Mary Collingwood from Wes Craven's first film, The Last House on the Left in 1972, but she unfortunately doesn't make it to the end of the film. She doesn't make it to the halfway mark of the film. A lot of the factors that make up a final girl can be tracked to John Carpenter's Halloween from 1978. Laurie Strode, by most accounts, is the perfect depiction of the final girl. A straight-laced bookworm who outwits the shape that killed all of her friends who fell into the deadly trap of being horny this would go on to be its own trope, but that initial conceit of the final girl having to be holier than thou to survive was never the original intent behind Deborah Hill and Carpenter's script. Part of the uh, reputation of Halloween is that, the, that all the girls who are promiscuous are the ones that get killed. But my thought was that um, Jamie Lee Curtis's character is more like the killer because she's repressed. The other girls are just acting normally. They're just normal teenagers, and they're not paying attention to their surroundings, they're, they're assuming that this beautiful little middle-class town is going to stay the same as it always has. They're not aware of the danger. But I didn't intend any moral. Even though Laurie is the poster model for this trope, Carpenter himself credits a different film for inspiring Halloween altogether. In 1974, the Canadian horror movie Black Christmas hit theaters, two months after the release of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If you've never seen it, spoilers I guess, but the film focuses on a sorority house during winter break that starts receiving disgusting phone calls from an unknown voice. And wouldn't you know it, he's also a psychotic killer. All the sorority sisters are killed off one by one, except for Jess Bradford, played by Olivia Hussey. Jess is portrayed as the more buttoned up and sheltered of the group, especially in comparison to Barb, played by Marco Kidder. There's a certain species of turtle that can screw for three days without stopping. Jess's fate is left ambiguous at the end of the film, but she was absolutely the blueprint. Black Christmas was directed by Bob Clark, who had also directed Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things and Death Dream. He and John Carpenter started working together on a project called Prey, which never got off the ground. During that time, Carpenter had a lot of thoughts about Clark's proto-slasher. According to Bob Clark, quote, John was a fan of Black Christmas, and he got Warner Brothers to hire me to do his first movie in 1976. It was about some killers in the mountains of Tennessee. We virtually cast it. John asked me at the time, do you ever want to make a sequel to Black Christmas? I said, John, your movie is my last horror movie. I love him, but I didn't come in to be just a horror maven. I came in to be a director, so I won't do another one. He said, well, if you did do it, what would it be? Because I bet you thought about it since Black Christmas did so well, unquote. Clark also relayed an idea to Carpenter in which Billy Lenz, the virtually unseen killer from Black Christmas, would have been caught between films, then escapes from a mental institution and returns back to the same house to claim more victims. And I know this sounds like the part in a bad music biopic where like Paul McCartney sees a guitar in a storefront, but the title for Clark's very unlikely sequel idea was called Halloween. Bob Clark would go on to say that Carpenter didn't rip him off and he stuck to his guns about no longer making horror movies. You may know some of his other movies like A Christmas Story and Porky's and Rhinestone. Oh. The final girl archetype has evolved and changed over the years with new and inventive characters and interpretations. But for us, the credit for the original lands on Jess Bradford's canary yellow shoulders. And hey, that's been a severely truncated history of some of the most popular and lasting tropes in horror movies. There's so many we could have tackled, but tell us, what do you think? What tropes should we break down next time? Are there any strange pockets of film history you'd want us to dive deep into? And how much wine do you think you could drink on a film set? Action, please. Ah, the French. Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. And for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, stay tuned to Nerdist.com. Happy Halloween, everybody.